Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit demo meeting. Uh, we are just over halfway through the 2019 calendar year now. Hard to believe it. You know, Q3 starting up, 4th of July around the corner. Exciting. It's getting hot. So let's hop in. We've got some new modules. Love new modules. Uh, let's see. Contributor Yaman furnished a new module targeting Nagios XI, which is version 556, leveraging two vulnerabilities found in the application to achieve unauthenticated root level remote code execution. From the contributor CyberGovernment comes a new module targeting system configuration tool Webmin, version 1.91. And earlier contain a vulnerability which allows authorized users with access to the package updates module to achieve root level remote code execution via an unsanitized data parameter. Contributor Carter Brainerd dropped a new module which will bypass user account control on any Windows installation that has PowerShell installed, allowing you to run a payload of your choosing with elevated privileges. You just need an existing session on your target and this module will leverage the scheduled silent cleanup task to do the rest. Uh, we might have a demo of this uh, today as well. And from our own Wei Chen comes a couple of new modules targeting Cisco Prime Infrastructure Network Management Tool version 3.4.0. The first module targets a vulnerability in the HA Health Monitor component, which does not check for any directory traversals while unpacking a tar file. Wei's new module exploits this, then leverages the upload servlet class to upload a JSP payload to the Apache Tomcats web apps directory and gain arbitrary remote code execution, no authentication required. Second module is a privilege escalation targeting a vulnerability with the runner shell utility, which itself is intended to run a shell script as root, but can be coerced to run your payload as root. And a few more, our own Aaron Soto created some new modules for enumerating AWS resources for AWS accounts that you have credentials for. You can use these modules to enumerate the EC2 and S3 instances, as well as the IAM credentials associated with a particular AWS account. And we should have a demo of these uh, today as well. Rounding out our list today, we have a new module from contributor Jay Digio that allows extraction from a PCAP file of a zip file being uploaded or downloaded via Modbus. Modbus is a very popular communication protocol used with programmable logic controller devices that you, such as you'd find in many industrial and SCADA systems. So this module may be of interest to users who target those sorts of things. Definitely some cool modules this week. And some interesting other work going on. Our own Tom Sellers made some improvements to the Bluekeep scanner module, including TLS support for targets which require TLS connections, adding user control of username, hostname, domain name, and IP address, which should reduce the ability to fingerprint this module and allow testers to better blend in with their target network, and documenting much of the binary blobs so that they're easier to understand. Contributor Semper Victus provided a new bind TCP stager for 64-bit Windows targets, which uses RC4 encryption. Contributor OJ Reeves added a new command from interpreter called secure, allowing the user to enable TLV encryption for sessions that are not encrypted or to negotiate new encryption keys for sessions that are already encrypted. OJ also provided an improvement to the HTTP payload callback listener, having it now treat any callback without the URI, URI or UUID in the same way as if it did, did not have a known UUID. This means that a listener will appear in these situations as if it is a default web server. And additionally, it will not spam the framework console with exceptions as the situation would previously entail. In Egypt, dropped an update of the struts2 content type OGNL modules check method to not expect the 200 status code in the target response as the 302 code had been observed in the wild for a vulnerable target. So nice set of improvements there. And bug fixes, we have some bug fixes. Contributor B. Coles added a fix to the ABRT, race ABRT privesc module to ensure the version check via YUM of the automatic bug reporting tool. The package happens properly. Contributor Tim Wright fixed some interpreter screenshot command logic to upload the associated DLL only when target, targeting Windows systems. Contributor Oshack dropped in a small fix for the check method of the xdebug unauth exec module, helping avoid bumping into an error when no response headers are available. And our own WVU fixed a bug in the Confluence widget connector module to ensure that the callback address for template loading is valid via the SRV host option. Always nice to get some fixes. 
and a bit of bonus content this week. Courtesy of Ron William Vu, we have a new entry in our development diary series. For those who aren't familiar with Metasploit's dev diaries, they're a look into how vulnerabilities and exploitable conditions make their way through the open source ecosystem to become stable seasoned modules and framework. In this entry, WVU analyzes the buffer overflow vulnerability behind an exploit module PR from Quentin Kaiser for a Cisco RB130 VPN router. It's a particularly cool write-up because ARM underpins so many of the little devices in our pockets and in our homes. Plus, if you're interested in Ghidra reversing, there's some of that too. Check it out on the research section of rapid7.com. And for details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blogs, uh, blog posts at blog.rapid7.com. And as always, a big thanks to everybody who helps make Metasploit better through their contributions. Thank you. Do we have an A soda? Yes, we do. Awesome. I mean, hand it over to hold up that slide there. Sure. Awesome. All right. AWS, AWS enumerations is is is. is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really enjoyed that title. Aaron. I wasn't sure if I'd snuck that past you or not. If maybe I got a chance to to mess with the slides before you got to see them. Um, <clears throat> before I start, well, I guess three disclaimers. One is I'm feeling a little congested, so I apologize if I'm uh, sounding kind of crappy. Uh, two is um, we're going to be looking at an AWS account. This is my AWS account, not some random AWS account, not Rapid 7's AWS account. So you're going to see some uh, access keys and, and tokens and such. Obviously, they're going to be invalid by the time you get to them, um, and they're very limited. Uh, the third thing is that these three modules that we're talking about do not attack AWS. They're using the AWS API in the ways that they're intended. Uh, and I want to emphasize that because uh, what we're doing is we're going after metadata uh, circled around uh, Elastic Compute Cloud, around the Identity and Access module, and around uh, the simple storage service. Uh, and the reason why we're doing that is, uh, well, twofold. One is that we get a, a full picture, but also that we get to kind of circumvent some of the traditional security methods. So if you have an EC2 instance, you should uh, hopefully have things like security groups, and network access policies. So for instance here, again, this is not a real IP address, but um, this is uh, an EC2 instance that's been locked down to where you can only SSH from a certain range of IP addresses. Um, and so the thing is, if you're going after the metadata, that's not actually gonna stop you. So this is not my IP address. In fact, it's not a valid IP address. Um, but if we take a look at these three modules here, we'll start off with uh, the Enum EC2 instance. And what this takes is two things, ostensibly. One is an access key, uh, the access key ID, and then the second is the access key itself. And these are two things that are associated with either user accounts or, uh, or they can be associated with services within AWS. And you might find them uh, if you were to compromise a single host. Sometimes you might find them in config files. You might find them even in code that's been up uploaded to, for instance, Git repositories. Uh, and with these things, this is literally all you need to begin querying AWS to search through uh, all the regions and all the services to start seeing what these can do. Now, it's important to point out that these keys can be locked down to a certain uh, minimized set of permissions. So in this case here, this key does have permissions because it's associated with an EC2 instance to look through the EC2 instances. Um, the second thing is that sometimes, depending on the service, they're locked down to regions. So you'll notice, for instance, the EC2 uh, module here takes a little bit of time because it literally has to query the API for every single region and go through to identify what instances are in that region. And if it finds one, it'll pull back as much data as we think was interesting uh, about that. So in this case, I actually have a, a, an EC2 instance that's not accessible, um, but we can see a little bit more about it. And obviously, uh, in this instance, I would have to be uh, inside this network in order to access it. But knowing is the first step of the battle. Knowing where it is and where we can go uh, is kind of where we can begin. Uh, now, it's important to point out that we can limit by region, and we can also assign a maximum number of instances to be returned, because obviously, in my case, I've got a really nice test account here. In a production case, you might have hundreds or thousands of instances that you don't want to pull back everything on, and so you might want to limit that down as much as possible, and uh, we do that as soon as we can. So if we take a look back, uh, back to the list, we have a couple more. Uh, and these work in, in the same way. Uh, there's a couple of different options associated with them. Uh, you'll notice that in this instance, we don't actually get uh, uh, in the identity and access module. These are uh, effectively users, uh, and these are limited to a region. Also, the AWS API doesn't allow us to limit the number of results returned, so we just get everything we can. 
Uh, and with this, we've gone through the API uh, results and pulled out everything that we thought was interesting. And we've also tried to make it a little bit more readable. So for instance, to, to tell you whether this test three account has ever been uh, allowed to log into the console, or if for instance, they have two factor off, and if so, when it was enabled. Uh, so you can get a lot of really kind of useful information out of this. Uh, and just to give a, a just to round out uh, the trio here, we'll take a look at uh, uh, the simple storage service, and you'll notice this also can be limited by region. Um, so in this case here, we see that there's a, a bucket, which was me sneezing on a keyboard, um, and this is actually associated with a website, and you can see the users that are, uh, have access to this. So in this case here, we have an AWS user, and we also have uh, the ability for AWS to, to uh, read logs from this, from this bucket. Uh, and so again, this is a, a kind of a first foray for us. We're interested in seeing what the community uh, is interested in, what uh, our users tell us is, is helpful or, or what we can add to this. Uh, you'll also notice this is structured that we've added this under auxiliary cloud and we put these in an AWS bucket. Uh, we might be interested in looking in other uh, services as well, other uh, kind of uh, cloud-based services. And so we're looking for feedback uh, there. So uh, certainly feedback welcome, PR is welcome and, uh, and we look forward to, to hearing how this is useful. Neat. Cool. Hello, hello. Today we are going to be demonstrating the silent cleanup UAC bypass module from our friend Carter Brainerd with a little bit of help from our discoverers. Let me scroll here. Turnid and Enigma OX7. Uh, that's James Forshaw and Matt Nelson. And also from a uh, Reddit post by Nisho69. So silent cleanup is actually a task in uh, the Windows Task Scheduler for Windows, of course. And uh, it allows you to execute a task for cleanup. And it actually runs with elevated privileges. And because of this, um, you can leverage it to bypass UAC and run uh, high integrity process. <clears throat> um, in fact, uh, there's even something cooler. There's a bit of a command injection from an unquoted, uh, not really service path, but an unquoted program path that's called, um, executes as cleanmanager.exe using a winder, temp, uh, winder uh, environment variable. And uh, if you can change that, which you can, um, you can actually point it to something else, uh, a substituted command. Let me find it here. Do, 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 do. Uh, right over here. Um, it actually injects this PowerShell script, PowerShell command um, within this PowerShell script, which is what's actually running to automate this entire process. Sets the environment variable. Uh, does a little bit of a sleep and uh, runs it with uh, SCH tasks, schedule tasks, and then removes the environment variable here. So we will actually test this. Um, unfortunately, it's not really a great way to demonstrate UAC being bypassed from the console. So I'll, I'll run a few commands and we'll see what it looks like. So. All right, we got menace point over here. And come back. We have meterpreter over here. Um, so this is just a Windows Edge testing VM. <clears throat> and I'm just gonna run this as the normal user, which does have administrator privileges. Uh, they're in the admin group specifically. And um, uh, we should be able to use this silent cleanup task to bypass, bypass UAC and uh, run a high integrity process from the normal medium integrity process. So I know this is a stage list, so let me clear screen quickly. Use exploit multi handler, set payload, I know it's 64 bit. Interpreter. Fortunately, now we have uh, master tab completion. Still a little slow because it's multi handler and has all the platforms and arches. Or options, make sure we set Alhos because I know it's different here. Uh, 56 is my subnet for 
uh, VirtualBox. Everything looks good. I'm going to clear my screen again. Run it. Great. It's listening. Let's go over here and run it as a normal user. Hope it works. Uh, smart screen. We can skip that here. AV evasion and all that uh, is left as an exercise to the reader. So we can get UID, sysinfo. Cool. Um, we have this over here. Uh, so you can't see what UAC status is as far as I know. Um, but we can use our smart use command here. Great. Uh, uses it. Options. We'll set our session to negative one, which is last session that we got. Uh, I'm going to drop into pry here. There's a bit of Ruby magic, of course, clearing my screen. So get integrity level. Uh, one, uh, 8192 is actually medium. Come on. You can see it right here, um, which means uh, uh, we're not running with uh, high probes here. Um, system is obviously even higher as far as I remember. So um, uh, sessions are a negative one, all this. Uh, I should probably bump WFS delay. I'll uh, probably change that in the module in PR or something for that. Um, you will see a little screen pop up. That could probably be fixed. Um, but here we go. Um, pretty easy. Just run it. It should handle everything else. It uploads the PowerShell script, executes it. You should see a flash in the background. There it goes. Any moment now. Hmm. Okay. Uh, the demo gods are not with us. Uh, it should have been deleted though, so we should be all right. Um, let's run it again. <clears throat> it might have needed a, the, the tweak here for the delay, actually. We can actually change that. It's a data store option. Hmm, okay. We'll set our sleep time. Yeah, let's set that to like five seconds. We'll run that again. That can probably be tweaked as a default as well. Hmm. Oops. Let's try that. Oh shit, did I do something wrong here? Yep, I did. This is my fault. I totally had the wrong L host. And payload too. My bad. Okay, now it should work. We can probably set the sleep time back to zero. Probably set WFS delay back to 10. We'll run it. Now it should work. Come on. Three, two, one, go. Go. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. So uh, still the, there's no clear indication here. We can hack it a bit and um, uh, we'll do set session to two. We'll do pry. Uh, we'll do clearing screen again, get integrity level. We can see we're 12288. Uh, we, we dump the integrity levels as a constant here. It is high, which means we have successfully bypassed UAC and we are running as full admin. And uh, that's really all there is to it. Um, I'd like to actually add this here as a, an enhanced, like, get, you know, whoops. Uh, that read line key binding doesn't work. 
Uh, it'd be great if there's like a dash V and it can show you extended information. Uh, but uh, I'm working on that right now. Right. Uh, also fix the authors. So here are all the authors. Um, uh, James Forshaw and Matt Nelson independently discovered it and I shown 69 also did and post about it on Reddit. Uh, Loki OX is uh, the one who wrote the PowerShell script and Carter is the one who took it all and put it into a module. So that's what you got here. Um, do remember, set your payload to be, <laughs> well, uh, don't assume it's gonna work right off the bat. So uh, yeah, set all that stuff up. That was just a sloppy mistake here. Great, uh, that's all I got. So, uh, yeah, um, thank you, Carter, and uh, thank you to everyone else who worked on this. Excellent.